Behind every success story, there is a long line of triumphs and defeats that remain hidden from others. These stories get condensed into journeys that minimize the struggle and wrap up with a happy ending. But we know that's not how life works. That's where From the Ashes with Mark Azoulay comes in. On today's show, you'll hear honest conversations about the challenges that Mark's guest faced and how they overcame adversity. Now, here is your host, Mark Azoulay. Welcome back to the show. I'm sitting here with returning guest Bree Walta and relationship expert um, to share about reviewing the past year of our relationship life and our relationship health. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had Susan Bratton on to talk about your sex life and your sex health. And now we're going to talk about the emotional side of the relationship of how you can just take an inventory of, hey, what's working, what's not, and how to make a change. Bree, welcome back to the show. Happy to be here. Yeah, Thanks so I'm, I'm excited for this one, right? Because we talked a little bit before the show of that, you know, New Year's comes around, people want to take time, they want to reflect, they get all jazzed up. And then right about now, maybe a couple of weeks into February, they're like, I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, the fear creeps quo. in. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I see this in, in my clients and in the people who I interact with just via Instagram and, and people in my community of there's a lot of pressure around new year's resolutions, right. And like spending time in December reflecting on the past year. And then like, this is the year I'm going to change. This is the year that I'm not going to go back to the X. This is the year that I'm going to actually leave the person that I know is not serving me. Um, or this is the year that I'm actually going to dive in and do some work and take accountability mm -hmm. or all of those things. Um, and it, it seems really exciting and maybe maybe scary, but more exciting in December. And then January comes around and we start to talk ourselves out of why we don't need to do those things anymore because the fear gets the fear gets bigger as the the timeline gets closer of when we said we were going to do the thing. So it's a very common, very common issue, very common frustration that I'm seeing with with people in my world. Yeah. So let Let's walk it through step by step, right? How would someone review their relationship and initially decide that they want to make a change? Because I know there's so many people, some of my clients that are like, I think this is fine, but I'm not sure. But like, you know, most of the days are good, but there's some really bad days. Or like, I'm with this person because they can tolerate me. Like, I hear that a lot, like, kind of like the shame <laughs> one, right? Um, yep. Or like, you know, my friends tell me that I should break up with this person, but I don't really see what they're saying. Like, there's like a lot of kind of ambivalence that can happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like to take my clients through, well, first, first of all, the very first question is in the relationship, are you feeling love and happiness the majority of the time, or are you feeling anxiety and frustration and confusion? Because I think a healthy relationship has, you know, we're, we're feeling loved and cared for and connected more of the time than we're feeling in conflict in some way. And unless you really stop to think about that, it can become really normalized that like, oh, I'm just really anxious in my relationships or we're always fighting, but that's just kind of how it is. And we ride it off as this normal thing where that's, that's really, relationships don't have to be that hard. They, they take effort, yes, but they don't need to be in that sort of energy all of the time, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, absolutely, right? And you know, we know from our work as, you know, clinicians that it's, it can be feel normal because that's how you were raised mm -hmm. to be in a high conflict relationship or to be in a relationship yep. that feels cold or dead or loveless, right. Or a relationship that might feel too logistical, right. Or just yep. all practical and very, just like, Oh, how was dinner? How was work? Good, good. Right. Like just like very surface level, you know, yeah. um, if that's what you grew up with, it's very common that you're going to think that that's normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's, I believe that we can, we, we settle into that comfort, right? Even though it's, it's not fulfilling and it's painful and it's the same thing every day, or it's actually abusive. We get used to that, but we settle into it because it's what we know, but there's deep down, like if you get still enough with yourself and connect back into the intuition part of you and your wisdom, and you can hear that voice. that's like, that maybe this isn't how relationships are supposed to be. Or maybe I'm not supposed to leave every conversation feeling confused. 
or maybe I'm not supposed to be this scared to speak my feelings. Mm -hmm. There's, there's little pieces I think that emerge throughout relationships that kind of offer us an invitation to listen. And we either are so disconnected from our, from ourself and our intuition that we don't, we barely hear it. And if we hear it, we, you know, swipe, (laughs) swipe the other way. But as you start to get more curious about your experience in the relationship and ask yourself more of those questions around how do I actually feel? And even writing it down, like I'm a big proponent of gathering data and when something happens, like how much of the time am I feeling this way? Or how much of the time do I try to bring my feelings to the conversation and I get, you know, pushed aside or told I'm too needy or too much, too emotional and, and starting to take, take track of, of when that's happening and how often that's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Can you run through some of the red flags, like the, you know, the Brie Walton, like (laughs) non-negotiables that might, you know, resonate with some of our listeners? Yeah. The no room for feelings is a big, big, big red flag of mine, Mm -hmm. because in order to have a healthy connected relationship, you have to be able to connect and we connect through being vulnerable. So if, if there's not emotional safety in the relationship and you don't feel safe to go to your partner and say, I'm feeling this way, or when you did this, it made me feel this without fear of causing a fight or backlash. That's not, that's not a safe space emotionally for you. A lot of my clients say like, it's just not worth it. It's not worth it to tell them how I'm feeling again, because it's going to cause a fight. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to be not talking for a week, or it's going to be this heavy energy of needing to walk on eggshells in the living room. (laughs) Like, you know, it's just, they get to the point where it's been proven so many times that the partner has zero tolerance for what they're feeling or what, what their experience is in general, that they learn to just stuff it down again. It's that constant reinforcement of that's not welcome here. And there's only so long that you can push that down before it, before something explodes or it comes out in some way. Yeah. 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 And that can go both ways. Right. So I work mostly with women, but women can also be the ones who are not as openly receptive to their partner's feelings as well. So this is a two way, two way street. And one of my biggest um, messages is that dysfunctional relationships is not one person's fault. Mm -hmm. Both people are experiencing dysfunctional patterns and playing into the dysfunctional patterns and spinning around and dancing with each other in this dysfunctional dance. So when you decide to start looking at your side, that's how you start to make changes for yourself. And sometimes that offers an opportunity for the other person to step forward and make changes. And therefore the relationship can change. And sometimes that becomes a threat to the other person and that causes the end of the relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's the thing of like, it sounds like another red flag. If you were trying to make change and your partner is either actively resisting it or maybe um, gaslighting you or shutting it down, right? Not giving it any kind of interest. That seems like that's a pretty dangerous place to be, right? Yes. Yes. If you're the one that is doing therapy for the both of you, or you're the one that's reading all the self-help books or listening to all the podcasts and trying to be the therapist for the couple, and your partner is repeatedly like sloughing you off or telling you it's stupid or just not engaging period. That's a huge red flag because again, partnerships are with two people. So two people, both people have to have the same desire to keep the health of the relationship alive. It's like nurturing a life. Both it takes, it takes energy and awareness from both people. So one person can't ruin an entire relationship and one person can't fix an entire relationship. It's always got to take both people putting in the same amount of, of energy. And that also comes down to both people being able to take accountability, which is another big red flag of mine. If you feel like everything's your fault and you're always the one that's apologizing or needing to start conversations and your partner is never bringing anything to the table or never um, identifying that maybe they did something wrong or apologizing. 
we're human. Of course, we're going to make mistakes. Of course, we're going to show up in relationship and hurt each other without intending to do so. Sometimes the partner is intending to do so, which is a whole nother, whole nother red flag. But if, if you both can't take accountability, then that leaves an unequal measure between the people in the relationship. One person becomes the mother or the father and the other person is the child that needs to be reprimanded or taken care of. Yeah. Which is shitty and like, and not sexy. Right. I (laughs) I think like when it turns into that type of relationship, I've seen often like sexual intimacy plummets, you know, a lot of resentment builds, I think on both sides, right. Like the, the child in this case, like gets really resentful and often gets like enabled Right. And then the parent builds resentment of like, oh shit, why am I doing everything in this relationship? Right. Yeah. Um, And, and we know that really, that resentment is the relationship killer, mm -hmm. right? Like when you, when you stuff down that resentment, there's, that's often the beginning of the end, unless there's some deep resolve around those things. But the more that you pack down the resentment of having to take care of them or having to remind them to clean the bathroom or unload the dishwasher, like they promised that it it's just like furthering the the distance between between the partners. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let me dovetail in this conversation, right? Of like, where do you draw the line in conflict? Or or maybe it's different for each relationship. You know, I um I have some clients, right, that in their relationships current and in the past, they've like been kicked out of the house, right? Or they've kicked that person out of the house. For me, I'm like, if that happens once, it's over, right? Like that is like a level of escalation that I'm personally not comfortable with. Um, yeah. Or yelling or breaking something, right? Or, you know, God forbid being physical. But for some people that's like normal or that's like, or tolerable, I don't know, normal. Um, yeah. So I'm curious what, what you would say about, you know, escalation mm-hmm. um, and intensity in a relationship. Yeah. Again, with the normal part of if you grew up in that, of course, that's going to feel normal yeah. to you. And to go always back to the the question of like, is this a fulfilling relationship? Like almost like an ROI, right? Like I'm putting in this investment. Am I getting back the return that I want in the ways that I want it? Not just what I'm comfortable with, but is it is it actually fulfilling and benefiting my life? But I really recommend making agreements with partners making agreements, but you know, when when they're neutral, when nothing's happening, but sitting down and saying, it's unacceptable for, to me to be yelled at. And I agree to not yell at you. Like if we get to the point where escalation is happening, we need to take a break and that's a non-negotiable. There's nothing that will get resolved when you're in that state of, of emotion and anger anyway. So having the awareness and the understanding and the respect to say, all right, I'm getting triggered as fuck right now. And I need I need to go take a walk. I will come back. We will revisit this. And then actually coming back and revisiting this. Yeah, not just burying it. Yeah. yeah. I think sometimes the the extreme of kicking someone out of the house, right? If if it's coming from a knee-jerk reaction of that's just how they solve the problem is to push it away and exert their power, that's a really unhealthy way to obviously to solve anything. Because often in my opinion, they're, they're doing that to then be able to have the other person, you know, they're, they're trying to have the power differentiator Mm -hmm. there. So the other person feels bad and comes back and apologizes and they get to be the hero and welcome them back, or they get to decide if they're coming back. Like it's, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that is an unhealthy mode for me. Um, when, when I hear that from clients, so knowing for yourself, what is acceptable and what's not is the most important thing aside from setting the agreements with your partner but in order to set agreements with your partner you first have to do the self-work to understand what it is that you're going to stand for and how you're going to set the boundary around that if if your partner start starts yelling how, how are you going to react not to make mm-hmm. them stop but to protect yourself from that situation absolutely yeah, yeah. and i think what we said before my next question is around the enabling behaviors on the other side mm-hmm. right you know, um, some clients I've worked with had to carry a lot of shame, right? Mm-hmm. And they've had a lot of shame growing up. They were shamed growing up by their parental figure or by society at large. And they're kind of like shame addicts in a way, yeah. right? That in that that shameful state of feeling like they're a piece of shit or feeling like they're unlovable or feeling like they're 
unworthy or they're broken um, is very strong in that. Yep. And they might do things, of course, not consciously, not intentionally, because nobody wants to feel that way, but unconsciously that keep them in that power under shame position. Mm -hmm. So long story short, I'm curious, what are some red flags that the person could, um, this hypothetical listener we're talking about, could kind of turn the the, um, focus back on themselves and look at like, oh, if you're doing these things, this is a red flag in the relationship. Yeah. First, I want to just touch on like the, the phenomenon of the repetitive compulsion, right? Like where we repeatedly bring people into our world to try to solve or to try to heal a wound that was created a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So we create these situations where we get to experience the shame that we know, and it reinforces that, that belief. And it's a really skewed way of trying to heal something, but that's just to sort of normalize that for people that that is a, that's a very human thing that yes. we do. Yes. So if you're in the relationship and you, you notice yourself sort of creating experiences like that, I think it's, I think it's a good exercise to be able to step back and first see what that limiting belief is. Like if you're constantly in that, in that shame spiral, and you are provoking your your partner to to create some sort of eruption so that then they can reinforce what you believe about yourself just getting curious with yourself of why why do i yell at my partner every time they do this thing because i know they're going to react this way and say this thing it's almost like we can predict how your how the partner is going to react so we mm-hmm. manipulate the situation in order to to have a predictable outcome does that make sense? <laughs> it does. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. It's like, oh, I know this place. I know how to navigate this. Yeah. Even though it's painful, I'm going to, I'm going to hit that button again. Right. Or I'm going to touch the yeah. fire again. Um, yeah. Or I'm going to do it in a way. Cause you know, I, I've, I've recently kind of um, asked my clients to tell me like play by play as much as possible, what their fights look like. And I imagine you probably do something similar. Mm-hmm. And when they're being honest, sometimes these people that are in the shame spiral will say things like, They'll, they'll preempt it, right? They'll be like, I'm so sorry, right? Like, I'm the worst, you know, it's me going, having it wrong again, right? Yeah. Like, you're so good to me, I'm such a piece of shit, right? Like, it'll, like, they yeah. start that off. Yeah. And then the partner is like, yeah, you are, right? I mean, they just like <laughs> double down, but there's yeah. sometimes that compulsion, yeah. Yeah, The and sometimes that can work the opposite way too in the manipulative sense of if I start by saying like, this is always my fault. I'm so unworthy. You deserve someone better. That puts the other person in the position to almost like comfort you when Mm -hmm. you should be either apologizing or you should be talking about how both of you were hurt in the fight. But it's, it's a way to, to go around the actual issue of whatever it is that needs to be talked about and skirt past the, the actual having to feel the shame and the embarrassment or whatever, whatever you're, like projecting in order to not have to feel. Right. And trying to get to that kind of like that super quick flip from like perpetrator to victim, right. Which can happen like really, really fast. Yeah. Um, So we're going to go to our first commercial break. When we get back, we're going to talk about, okay, so you've, you know, you've diagnosed your relationship, you know, you got issues. How do you start to make meaningful change to to switch it around Um, or get out if that's what's appropriate. So if you're listening, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you on the other side of the commercial break. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. In Mark's work with high performers and business owners, it is becoming increasingly clear to him that their biggest obstacle to success is themselves. They are experts in their field, but are dragged down by their anxiety, poor time management, inability to focus, or self-sabotage. His role is to help you overcome these emotional and organizational issues so that you can truly excel in your business and your personal life. One of the most common hurdles that he sees is perfectionism, a crippling anxiety around performance. It's a fear of not being good enough, being publicly embarrassed, or of disappointing others. These fears paralyze brilliant people and bring them to their knees. 
This course will help you to break free from this mental prison and have more agency in your world. In this online course, we will break down the prison of perfectionism so that you can break out of it. For more information and to sign up, visit Mark dash azule dot teachable dot com that's mark m a r c dash azule a z o u l a y dot teachable dot com where can you listen to some of the world's top life coaches ready to dish out success tips and entrepreneurial guidance the voice america empowerment channel will do just that whether it's personal growth, building a better business, or inspirational life stories, make it a daily habit to tune into our programs. From weight loss and personal branding to law of attraction and increased happiness, you'll find it every day at VoiceAmericaEmpowerment.com. The Voice America Empowerment Channel. It's your world. Motivate. Change. Succeed. Our thoughts and feelings not only affect our own lives, but the lives of everyone around us. Find new meanings of love, authentic expressions, and better connections with the people in your life. Tune in to Love Light with Dr. Jean Marie Farish. This program will feature guests and discuss ideas that will bring a better life to you. When you find this perspective on love, it will change everything. Listen live every Friday at 12 noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. It's your world. Motivate. Change. Succeed. VoiceAmericaEmpowerment.com You are listening to From the Ashes with Mark Azoulay. To reach the show today, please call 1-888-346-9141. That's 1-888-346-9141. Or send an email to podcast at mark com. Now, back to From the Ashes. Welcome back to the show. So we're walking through this timeline of acknowledging a chain, right? That they've done the audit. Hopefully, they've noticed some of these red flags. Uh, well, I guess hopefully not. You don't want to be in that relationship. But if you did notice some of these red flags, then the question is, okay, how do you actually make a change? How do you come up with the courage or the community or the connection or the, or the willpower to make a change. Yeah. Well, as we were just chatting about the change is the hardest thing as a human to, to reconcile with, or to feel comfortable in because inherent in change is unpredictability. Mm -hmm. And we like to know what's going to happen, which is one of the reasons we stay in these dysfunctional relationships, because we know what's going to happen, even though it doesn't feel good, we can anticipate the reactions, anticipate the silent treatments, the eggshells, the abuse, whatever it is. And so thinking about doing something different can feel, even though it, it will very likely be a much better situation on the other side, it's terrifying. And normalizing that for, for people, that change of any kind is really, really scary. And especially change in relationships and how we feel like we belong in this world is really, really scary. So when you, when you come to terms, I think with the relationship and if in my experience, anyway, once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. And so there was this pulling from part of me that was like, you need to leave this, this relationship is not only not serving you, but it's hurtful and harmful to you now. And then there was this other part of me that was, they were combating that was like, no, like we're fine. If I keep just changing this one thing or change this other thing, I haven't tried this yet, you know, and you start to rationalize why you should stay. So when you start hearing that other voice, that's like, you, you can't unsee this. There's no going back from the awareness that you have now. And so it's a matter of when you're thinking of the pain of the, of what, fear brings in the pain of the change, whatever. It's like, do you want the band-aid ripping off pain that's short term and might hurt like hell, but it will have an end? Or do you want to stay in this painful relationship for more years, years of pain? And in my experience, when I had someone say that to me, when I was contemplating change, I was like, Ugh. it was like the gut punch in the, 
like, oh, okay, I think this, this is the scary option, but this is what needs to happen because otherwise I'm going to live a life like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's so wild to me. Like, maybe not wild, but just, just some of human nature. I'm curious your thoughts on it, right? Of I've worked with clients that are in these situations, sometimes awful abusive of situations, and they will make tons of changes, but not the change that they need to make, right? Not the big one, right? So they'll be like, oh, well, you know, my partner like always looks at my phone. So I'm just going to hide my phone. I figure a way to hide my phone, right? Or like my partner says he hates the music that I play. So I'm just never going to play that music in my life ever again, right? Yeah. Or like, you know, my partner comes home drunk on Thursdays. So like, I'm just going to make plans on Thursdays and not be around. Like, you know, there's like all these like adaptive changes to adapt mm-hmm. to the suffering rather than I think what you're talking about, which is like trying to end the suffering. Yeah. Which often looks like breaking up with that person, right? Like just cutting bait. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we do those little changes to try to convince ourselves that it's going to be okay, mm-hmm. right? And like, how many times are we going to need to make all of these little changes to to show ourselves that things are still not actually changing? That the baseline of the relationship is still rooted in anxiety and fear. Mm-hmm. And one of the biggest fears I hear from clients is if I leave him, I'll be alone forever. And they believe that deeply, deeply believe that not just because they've been fed that they're too emotional or, um, too much, right. They have too many needs or they're always causing problems. Like who would ever want you? That's, that's a common thing that my clients are told from their partner, but they don't have a sense of confidence in themselves. So I think a vital part of of having the courage to leave is first building the confidence within yourself of who you are and, and you standing for that, you having a healthy relationship with you, because if you can make that reconnection, it doesn't really matter if you have a partner or not, right? Your okayness no longer is in the hands of someone else or in the frame of a relationship. Like I'm worthy and I'm lovable if I have a partner because they confirm that it can be, I'm a single person and I'm still worthy and lovable because I confirm that you don't need that external validation. Do you see that come up often with your, with your clients too? Oh, I do for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I work mainly with men. So I don't don't think this is a gender situation. Uh -uh. Um, I think it's a human situation where like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I have, you know, what I tell my guys is like, you know, your relationship should be the icing on the cake, but like your life has to be the cake, right? Yeah. You got to like put yeah. in all those ingredients. <laughs> you got to bake it well. You got to like make it awesome. Yep. Um, that you can go without a relationship. But yeah, let me say this, I'm gonna say this because this came up with a client um, a couple months ago where he was saying he was afraid to follow that methodology, right? Of kind of like making his life the cake because it meant that his relationship would be like a little more irrelevant. Hmm. Right. Like it wouldn't matter as much or it wouldn't be able uh, to touch him as much because there'd be a, there'd be a little bit of a separation there. Uh-huh. And I'm like, yeah, that's called codependency, but <laughs> I'm curious about, <laughs> about your thoughts on yeah. that. Cause I do think yeah. it, it does require like dismissing your partner a little bit and mm-hmm. not taking things as personally. Right. And being like, Oh, that's your stuff. Not my stuff. Yeah. Well, space is really threatening to codependent people. Yeah. If you're used to being enmeshed, you're used to being as one with the other person, you know? And so to, to offer them that maybe you can be interdependent and have your own sphere of self and then move alongside another person's sphere of self and like enjoy life that way. It's almost like trying to speak to them in another language. They're like, can't compute what what you're saying and how that could be fulfilling because they've only grown up in the codependent way. So a lot of people, I think that don't have a sense of self and don't have the, the, they weren't taught, not that they don't have it, but they weren't taught when they were younger, how to be interdependent because they grew up in chaos. They grew up in dysfunction. They grew up in codependency and you get really good at being externally focused. So when you grow up in environments where you have to be hyper vigilant on other people's needs and emotions that's what you learn. You learn how to do that really, really well, but that doesn't give you a lot of time and space to explore inside the needs and emotions. So we just cut it off. We're like, I don't need, I don't need anything. Like I take care of other people. 
I know what they need. That's my role. I, I care for them. I rescue them. I people please, whatever the, the verbiage is that resonates. And we forget that our, like we have needs in the first place and they are equally as important as other people's needs. Mm -hmm. So the fact that, that my clients and your clients and these people who grow up in these situations are like lacking confidence and lacking self-esteem or even a sense of who they are is not, it's not shocking because they didn't have, they weren't given the environment to explore who they are. Yeah. And that is unbelievably common, right? Yeah. Of people that, you know, you dive a little deeper and they feel like they don't have a personality. Like you said, they don't know yeah. who they are. They don't, they don't even know what they like. Yes. Yes. You know, it's like, it's crazy. There's like the normal stuff, right. Or okay. they try to conform or there's like a, there's a keeping of oneself small and uh -huh. not developing like preferences or hobbies or, you know, interests that might stray from the norm that might get them judged or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We, and I'll speak cause I'm in recovery from codependency, obviously also, mm -hmm. but we chameleon into other people. Yeah. So we learn how to just absorb what other people like to do and just become that. And in my own experience, I remember like meeting new people was always, I liked meeting new people, but I hated the question that you would always get of like, well, what do you like to do for fun? And I'm like, I don't know. What do you like to do for fun? Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I didn't have an answer. And that wasn't even alarming to me until after I got out of the, the toxic relationship that catapulted me into this work where I was like, huh, maybe it's time to like actually figure out who I am outside of a person outside of their validation of, of me. And I take this, I take my clients through this exercise. Now it's like, I literally want you to write down when you're in, in a moment and you're like eating a piece of chocolate. You're like, I like this, write it down. Mm -hmm. Right. You're out for a walk. I like this, write it down. And you start to build a list of things that you like to do. And you have to have that exercise of, of, being able to reflect on that because otherwise you're just doing things, but you're not like categorizing it as, Oh, these are my values. These are, these are how I find joy in life. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm so, I'm so curious for you, if you feel comfortable answering, what are some things you found out about yourself? Like, was there anything that was surprising or. So know? I, I love spending quality time with people like deep conversations, one-on-one, -on -one, like let's go there. That's my type of of jam. Obviously I'm a coach. Like I, <laughs> that's something that fills me up, mm -hmm. but I always thought that that didn't like qualify as a, a hobby. And so when people would ask me, I'm like, I don't know, I don't like play music. I don't, I don't I go skiing. Like I don't do an outward hobby thing, but I like to spend time with people. Mm -hmm. And as, as the more I got comfortable with that for myself, the more I got comfortable standing behind that as an answer where it was like, yeah, this is what actually fills me up. I love one-on-ones. I love going for walks with people. I love having coffee with people. I love hiking with people. Like I don't really love the big party atmosphere, you know? And it's like, that's, that's an okay qualifier also. Um, and even taking walks, that's one thing that I always thought I just did because either to work through some emotional thing or nature or something, but I didn't qualify it as being important enough to be on a list of like, what do you like to do? You know, the joke of like long walks on the beach. Like I kind of like long walks on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> so I think giving, giving yourself permission for those, those things that you like to be big or small, but mm -hmm. they're impactful for you in some way. Yeah. What are some of yours? Oh, so, so for me, um, Actually, during COVID, I did this whole thing. I was supporting my therapist to like go back and do stuff I did as a kid and uh -huh. try to reconnect with that because I was like, well, a lot of my business stuff, I mean, you, you knew me in that was like a lot of my time was networking, presenting, working, like traveling yeah. and all that just shut the fuck down. So I was like, all right, well, what can I do by myself? Um, so I went back and I got into uh, painting models. So I like building and painting models was something I did as a kid. Cool. And I, I love it now. And it's, I'll tell you, it's a, hobby that's a lot better now that I'm smarter and I can actually like follow directions <laughs> and that I have money to buy all the like paint supplies and things. Yeah. Um, so that was a big one that I came in to realize. I think part of my recovery from drugs and alcohol dancing was one that was surprising to me. I always saw myself as like a shut down, like, is that like nerdy kid 
that was like overweight and had like no coordination. Like I really had a low shame based, you know, view of myself, yeah. but like dancing to like electronic music. I actually love mega crowds, like thousands of people. Like I went to decadence yeah. over new year's, which is like, I think it was like 15,000 people or something Oof. in the convention center. <laughs> like I, I like the anonymity of a crowd. And I like just like throwing down in a crowd. And that was something yeah. that was surprising. And it's a part of my kind of personality that, um, I have to nurture. And if I don't nurture that, I, I get sad, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> if I'm not like expressing myself through dance, it, it's very important. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. So, so I'm curious, you know, you did mention you have a, a coaching container coming up and mm -hmm. you're talking that it's in a group format. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that, right? Because I think we talk about fear to make a change. What I've seen in my clients, a lot of that is like loneliness, just like you were saying yeah. of you're unlovable. No one's in your corner. No one's ever going to be with you again. Yeah. Um, but you do these things in groups. Can you say a little bit more yeah. about that? Yeah, I choose group formats because there is so much embarrassment and isolation that come from being in repeated dysfunctional relationships. You know, oftentimes when we are going back to the same person or we're secretly calling that booty call because we're too, like we would never admit it to our friends or family that we're still seeing this person, it, it, it isolates you from your connected, from being able to be vulnerable with your connections. So we can't share everything with the people that are closest to us because they'll judge us or they have their opinions or they're not supportive of our process, whatever it is. So we isolate. And the more that we isolate, the more that addiction grows. And we know this from drugs and alcohol and eating disorders. Like whenever you're hiding something, it's giving it power. Yeah. So just being in a, a circle with other women who it's not only a safe space, but it's a space where everybody is also going through some flavor of the same problem, the same issue. It's like the me too movement, right? It's like, Oh, I'm not alone in this. Oh, I don't have to feel, I'm not the only one who feels crazy, like texting their ex at 2 AM, you know, and it, it brings some normalcy to the struggle and the safety to be able to unpack the struggle. And I think if you have a good therapist or a coach that can be, you can create a healthy relationship one-on-one, -on -one, but there's a whole nother level of healing that happens even by listening to someone else process. And you're like, oh my God, that's my story. And you, you almost heal on behalf of them as they are moving through their, their experience. Um, we can talk more about this on the other side, but I use a, a modality called EFT, the emotional freedom techniques tapping. And there's a phenomenon called borrowing benefits from that work where when you're tapping along while someone else is processing, you're actually unconsciously helping to process your own mm -hmm. subconscious beliefs, which is fascinating to add in the body component in a, you know, in addition to the talk processing. That's really interesting. Yeah. We'll talk about that on the back on the end of the break. Cause I think groups are groups are the thing, right? And I, I tell my clients that individual therapy exists only to prepare you for group. That's like, <laughs> that's the primary function. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Learn about yourself, learn about your personal story, get okay, tolerating emotions, and then go in community. Yeah. And a lot of people are scared shitless of groups. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. So we'll talk more about that. we got to go to our uh, next commercial break. Um, hang on in there and we'll see you on the other side. Follow us on Twitter at VoiceAmericaTRN. Get the lowdown on guests, new shows, and your favorites. That's VoiceAmericaTRN. In Mark's work with high performers and business owners, it is becoming increasingly clear to him that their biggest obstacle to success is themselves. They are experts in their field, but are dragged down by their anxiety, poor time management, inability to focus, or self-sabotage. His role is to help you overcome these emotional and organizational issues so that you can truly excel in your business and your personal life. One of the most common hurdles that he sees is perfectionism, a crippling anxiety around performance. It's a fear of not being good enough, being publicly embarrassed, or of disappointing others. These fears paralyze brilliant people and bring them to their knees. This course will help you to break free from this mental prison and have more agency in your world. In this online course, we will break down the prison of perfectionism so that you can break out of it. 
For more information and to sign up, visit mark-azulay.teachable.com. That's mark, M-A-R-C, dash, azulay, A-Z-O-U-L-A-Y, dot, teachable.com. Voice America programs are now available on your favorite connected device, including Amazon, Alexa, and Google Home. Through streams with Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, and iHeartRadio, listening to your favorite show is as easy as saying the show name followed by the word podcast. Hey, Alexa, play Finding Your Frequency podcast. If that doesn't work, try adding on TuneIn or on iHeartRadio or on Apple Podcasts. Are you ready to move to your next level? Listen for Empowering Women, Transforming Lives with host Rebecca Hall Greider. Each show will focus on a central topic with discussion, guests, and your questions being featured. Our show is perfect for women who feel a call in their heart to step out in a bigger, more powerful way in their life and just need some encouragement, inspiration, and practical steps to support them on their journey. Empowering Women, Transforming Lives can be heard live every Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel with a replay of the show Sunday at 1 p.m. Pacific Time and 4 p.m. Eastern on the Voice America Variety Channel. Get the news on our shows and other happenings by following us on Twitter. Find us at Voice America TRN or twitter.com forward slash Voice America TRN. You are listening to From the Ashes with Mark Azoulay. To reach the show today, please call 1-888-346-9141. That's 1-888-346-9141. Or send an email to podcast at mark-azoulay.com. Now, back to From the Ashes. Welcome back to the show. I'm sitting here with relationship expert Bree Walta, and we're talking about toxic relationships. And specifically what I was kind of queuing into was the secret aspect that I think a lot of people have. You mm-hmm. know, like you said, the booty call that they call that they are like too ashamed to admit anybody. Or I think of like, oh, you know, I invite him over again, um, but I, I shouldn't have. Like there's something almost like erotic about that, I think. And I think it shows yeah. up in media a lot right of like the secret relationship that is really rocky but then like turns around and it's like you did love each other forever you just needed to grow up you know like you know i I think of like the high school trope of like someone like throwing a rock at your window and like you open the window and you sneak out or something right like it's almost like we're conditioned to if something is secret but endures it's special or magical Mm -hmm. rather than like shameful and like maybe problematic (laughs) you know yeah well, it's exhilarating. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's a drug. It, when you get the rush of him or her coming over and not just the rush of, you know, having sex or whatever, whatever physical aspect is happening, but also the rush of like, yeah, nobody can know. And it's almost, it's almost like the, um, it amplifies the, the highs and the lows because not in the highs, it's like, this is so good. And I can't tell anybody about it. And in the lows, it's like, Oh, he dumped me again. And I can't tell anyone about it. And it's like, it's like feeding into these really unhealthy roller coaster cycles of the, it's not a stable relationship. It's like, I need the dramatic. I need the ups and the downs to feed the the addiction and the familiarity that I have with chaos. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and one thing I work a lot with my clients is on is on fantasy, right? And I think it keeps a relationship in the realm of fantasy mm-hmm. because if you never have to integrate that person into your day-to-day life, right? If they're yeah. just like the weekend booty call or like the drunk dial, like you don't have to yeah. see what they would be like if they were actually a partner in your life. Like how, how do they interact like randomly on a Tuesday night, right? Yeah. Like what yeah. is their work-life balance really like? You know, like, yeah. are they good with kids? You know, do they get along with your other friends? Like all these questions you don't really have to confront them because it is, no. it's just existing in this like little pressure cooker. Yeah. You don't have to be vulnerable. Like yeah. You get the pseudo sense of vulnerability via intimacy mm-hmm. without the actual connection or without the actual potential of being hurt. Because if I keep this person at arm's length and we're on this crazy roller coaster together and it's just fun, 
like it's never progressing to the stage of, oh, now I need to start having real conversations or now I need to start setting boundaries or now we need to talk about kids or talk about what this relationship is. And in all of those pivotal conversations, there's always an opportunity to be abandoned. Mm -hmm. And so if I just don't have those conversations, if I don't ever let a, a relationship progress past X stage, then I'm protecting myself from, from being hurt. And also preventing myself from feeling actual connection. But in that moment, like the not being hurt is a bigger priority than feeling connected. Yeah. Yeah. And then just like, you know, the years, like you said, because sometimes click by and then it's like, whoa, hold on. Like I haven't yep. been in a quote, you know, real relationship for yep. a decade. Yep. Right. It's just been doing this or just been doing casual hookups or just been doing, you know, this booty call thing or just been going around this merry-go-round a thousand times. Yep. Yeah. And for the people who are going back to a really unhealthy people and are, maybe it's not feeling super exhilarating anymore, but it's something you can't let go of. There's also this sense of like, I'm taking a little hit of the drug because being at home alone with myself and having to feel my feelings or, or feel the fear of what it's like to be single is too extreme. I need to numb it a little bit. Right. Their, the capacity to hold emotion is not there. So they're reaching out and they're grabbing the, the quick fix, which after the fix comes the shame. And then the yeah. shame breeds the isolation and the isolation pushes you further into the addiction and the inability to sit with yourself. And it just compounds the emotions. So the, you need the drug more. And it's just, it's just the drug cycle. It's the addiction cycle. Yeah. It's just the same loop to loop. I mean, very well said a big part of my recovery was, you know, mindfulness meditation and yeah. learning how to um, not just experience, but actually enjoy solitude yeah. and like truly being with myself with little to no stimulus. And like you said, yeah. in the beginning, it was like very painful because I had a lot of backed up emotions from like my yeah. 15, 20 years of life before then um, yeah. that I never processed. But now, yeah. and you know, I'm always saying to the listeners, like now it's actually incredible. Because I don't have that backup. Like, yeah, there might be a day or two of like a little bit of sadness or like some introspection, but then I'm like, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm I'm fine because I, yeah. I work through it and I can really enjoy it. Yeah, um, you allow yourself to feel it, which is the the more important part of being alone than just being alone, right? Like, I remember in my story, I, I knew this. I knew I needed to learn how to be by myself. Mm -hmm. So I would be feeling fine and I would sit down on my bed. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm making space to cry. Like I could just like, make that happen at, like, on I'm my ready. whim. Let's do it. I'm ready. <laughs> I feel, I feel grounded. Let's do this. Right. And, and obviously it wouldn't happen in those moments. And I'd be like, well, I'm trying, I'm trying to be with myself, <laughs> but it was the moments when, when I actually like got hit with the wave of a feeling mm -hmm. when I could finally like sit down and be like, oh, this is when I need to actually feel it when it's happening instead of pushing it away while it's happening and addressing it later that's the practice of being with yourself and of being alone. Because even when you're in relationships, you need to have that skill. You need to be able to self-soothe and self-regulate before you go to your partner for the connection or the conversation or whatever it is. Yeah, you don't have to dump all that on them, right? Like <laughs> it's okay yeah. to be messy with your partners every once in a while, but I, I think most of the time it's like deal with it and then communicate the relevant parts. Yeah. Because I, I think and that makes it a partnership and not like, we talked before, like a parent child relationship. Yeah. And as you are regulating and feeling and, and dealing with the emotion, you also become clear on what you need, mm -hmm. right? So if you're feeling anger, you feel it, you work through it, you process it, you're curious about it. And then you're like, oh, I need this from my partner. And you can communicate then what you need instead of communicating your anger mm -hmm. and, and expecting them to fix or soothe the anger because that's not their responsibility. Their responsibility is to to be in partnership with you and to respect your needs, but it's not to fix you and it's not to it's not to solve your problems. Right. Yeah, and certainly not to mind read you. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. like oh, they're angry. You know, just like we do with the baby. Like toy. Yeah. Diaper. Yeah. Milk. Toy. Yeah. Right. Like just like yeah. keep trying stuff. Like that's not a great relationship. Um, yeah. So I, I want to bring you back to your, your coaching program. I know you've like helped and probably changed the lives of tons of women. Um, and I wonder, are there any success stories that you'd like to share or maybe themes yeah. if you don't want to share people's personal stories, which I totally understand, like things yeah. that arise um, in the work that you do? Yeah. One of the most pivotal 
women or women that experienced the most pivotal change for me was she was in a marriage of 25 years on and off with a, uh, from what I can diagnose from afar, you know, a a narcissist, Mm -hmm. very dysfunctional, very manipulative. And she kept getting hooked back in to his promises and the sex and the, the hope that this relationship was going to, for the 50th time of going back, was going to give her a different result. And the biggest shift for her was getting really clear on what, what her values and her needs and her wants were. And again, writing that down as data for herself so that when he would approach her with something, she could run it by those things and say, oh, this is not aligning with any of these things. Why am I continuing to go down this road? And for her to be able to shift and get a text from him that didn't elicit that like pull Mm -hmm. was transformational. And she was able to stop going back. And now she's experiencing a healthy, a healthy relationship for the first time. And and, you know, she's in her forties. So huge. Yeah. Yeah. I guess she's in her fifties if she had a 25 year relationship, (laughs) but regardless, Oh, you know, the stage of life where we should have things figured out. That's also a big myth that a lot of my clients believe of they're somehow defective because they haven't learned how to do relationships yet. Like, well, you weren't set up in the way to do that. So another woman that I just had in this uh, past group, she was really unsure what she wanted to do. If she wanted to keep going back to the same person, cause they would have like really euphoric couple of weeks and then it would be hell. And then he would leave and just ghost her. And then it would happen all over again. And she's like, I see that this is not fine, but I can't stop. And again, for her, it was building that confidence from who she is, uh, you know, at her core and learning that he was actually a reflection, a direct reflection of her father. And she was trying to find the validation and the acceptance from him that she really needed to soothe herself from something she was never going to get from her dad. And working with her through comforting those inner parts, the inner children, the inner teenagers that were like needing her attention was huge for her. And she's created a dialogue with them and she can soothe them. So she's not constantly just seeking the external to, to fix her. Yeah. That's a phenomenal story, right? I mean, yeah. just that thing of so many people that find themselves in this situation are caregivers. Yeah. And it's like, if you can just turn like a fraction of that caregiving onto yourself, like it's yeah. so powerful. Yeah. So I love hearing so that powerful. she, you know, contacted her inner child or inner teenager mm-hmm. and was able to really soothe that person. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Rather than putting all the energy into soothing, soothing an abusive partner. Yeah. And the shifts in, in all my clients across the board, you know, they come to me with the, the romantic issue, right? They keep attracting the same type of romantic partner. But when they start to do these exercises and build these boundaries for themselves and learn how to communicate and learn how people are mirroring things that they need to tend to, they shift their friendships, they shift their work environments, they shift relationships with their parents, with their family. Mm -hmm. So learning how to be in relationship with yourself first and foremost is the foundation for you to be in a healthy relationship with anybody. It doesn't have to be a healthy relationship or it doesn't have to be a romantic partner. It's how we operate in all, all phases and all aspects of our life. That's great. I mean, very yeah. well said. So we have to start to wrap up here. Um, but Brie, can let people know where they can find more information or sign up for your next group? Yeah. So I am very active on Instagram. My handle is lucid living with Brie. And I have a 12 week group coaching container that's opening on February 7th. So these are closed groups. I keep them under six women and it's all virtual. So if you're interested in moving through 12 weeks of inner work to help find yourself and help level up your relationships, help yourself from, you know, learning how to not feel guilty in all of your relationships or finally understand why you keep going back and then shift that pattern. That is the, this is the container for, for that type of person who's in that space of like, almost rock bottom with relationships. Like I can't keep doing the same dance over and over with different people. I'm exhausted. And they've tried therapy. Oftentimes they've tried other healing modalities. And I really believe that sometimes in therapy, we can get stuck in 
understanding. Like we know why, right? I can tell you, rationalize, analyze all the things. But if we never get into the body where we're holding all of these emotions and traumas and start to integrate those and learn how to comfort your inner parts, that's, that's when the shift starts to happen. And then to be able to do that in a community, in a group setting with other women where you're healing your attachment wounds of just belonging is, is how you are held in making really dramatic changes in your relationships. Yeah. Well said. I think it's like, agree. I think it's the community that heals. Yeah. And it's that accountability. And I imagine a big part of it is like that reality testing, right. Of being like, is this okay? I mentioned before that like you'll read their text messages and be like, is, is this all right? Like what's yeah. happening here? Yep. Um, so yeah, if you're listening or if you know somebody um, in a Tachi relationship, send them this podcast, send them Bree's information. Uh, she really is an expert in this area and she can help people get the help that they need um, and connect with other women that are going through the same thing, which I think is, could be friends for life. You know, it could be a yeah. really big um, step to help people grow. So thank you so much for tuning in. Bree, thanks as always for joining us on the show. Yes, um, thank you. Listener, we will see you next week on another episode of From the Ashes. Thank you for joining host Mark Azoulay on From the Ashes. Be sure to tune in again live next Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time and 11 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel or subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Meet triumph and defeat and treat those two imposters the same. <laughs>